Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 9K, where we're going to move on from talking about intraspecific hybrids to interspecific hybrids, hybrids between different species. We'll talk about examples from animals and examples from plants. We'll talk about the phenomenon of hybrid vigor and the fertility problems that are very common in these hybrids, and the possibility of hybrids between distant relatives. Now, most interspecific hybrids are not viable. They're only viable between some closely related species. Some cases have been studied in quite a bit of detail and exploited by humans. These are cases where the hybrid exhibits higher vigor or generally better properties than its parents. So one classic example is the mule. A mule is an animal a lot like a horse, but it's a hybrid between a horse and a donkey. It has very high vigor, but it's infertile, for reasons we'll come back to in a minute. Other animal hybrids that have been created artificially often in zoos are hybrid birds between a canary and a goldfish, between a lion and a tiger, between a zebra and a donkey. These are often treated as novelties. It's not clear that we have much to learn about biology from them. In plants, hybrids between species occur much more easily. Um, some hybrids even occur between different genera rather than the genus is the next group out from the species. So species of different genera are more distantly related. One very successful hybrid is between English ivy, hetera helix, and the plant called Japanese fatsia. Ivy, of course, is a vine. It climbs up walls, clinging to them with little stickers. Um, fatsia is a shrub. It grows vertically. The hybrid is called fats hetera because that's a combination of the two genus names. You can often find it in garden shops. It's a very handsome plant, and its growth habit is, well, it's erect, like it's fatsy apparent, but it's not as sturdy. It will only grow a few feet unless you give it some support. Other plant hybrids that occur naturally, uh, the grapefruit is a spontaneous hybrid, um, so is peppermint, and many sunflower species, especially in desert plants, are hybrids between other sunflower species. So the hybrids that we see most commonly, for example, the mule, show a remarkable vigor. Mules are valued for their stamina and their strength, their endurance. And it's tempting to think that high vigor might be a typical feature of interspecific hybrids in the same way that we see high vigor when we cross different inbred lines of the same species. But there's very little evidence that high vigor is typical. Many of most interspecific hybrids aren't viable at all or are quite sickly. When we see, we focus on the vigorous examples because they're the most used to us. When hybrid vigor occurs in an interspecific hybrid, the cause is probably the same as the, what we described for um, hybrids between inbred plants, that it's complementation of recessive alleles that in the individual species make it somewhat less vigorous, less healthy, but in the hybrid it gets the benefit of both kinds of alleles. But probably this vigor is quite an uncommon feature of interspecific hybrids. On the other hand, the lack of fertility is a very common feature of interspecific hybrids. Essentially all interspecific hybrids are more or less sterile. And the reason is problems with chromosome pairing in meiosis. The hybrids are unable to produce functional gametes with complete sets of chromosomes. And that's because the chromosomes from different species are rarely able to pair up to properly in meiosis. Even if all the chromosomes are present in the same number and each chromosome has the same genes, the genes are likely to be arranged differently. This is something we'll discuss in more detail in Module 10. And these different arrangements mean that pairing still goes wrong in meiosis 1, and the gametes get incomplete sets of chromosomes. In plants, this infertility problem can sometimes be rescued by a second error 
it doubles the sets of chromosomes so that every chromosome has someone to pair with. We'll discuss this in Lecture 10b. What about more distantly related species? Well, hybrids rarely form, and that's because mate recognition systems are usually completely incompatible. Certainly all of the behavioral features that serve as cues to let an organism know who it should consider mating with generally don't work across species. Um, here in the sketch, the dog and the cat are not at all interested in each other as possible mates. Also, the biochemical mechanisms that allow gametes to fuse tend to be very species specific so that even if the sperm and the egg were to be in the same animal, likely the sperm would not recognize the egg as something that could be fertilized, or the egg would not recognize the sperm as something that was allowed to fuse with it. Furthermore, if mating does occur, there's almost always developmental incompatibilities so that the embryo is aborted. So we've been talking about interspecific hybrids between closely related species. We see animal hybrids, a few um, well-studied examples because they're useful to us or interesting novelties. In plants, there's been much more natural spontaneous hybridization over evolutionary time between close species. Hybrids are often more vigorous than either parent and they're almost always sterile. Between distant re relatives, basically hybrids are not exist non-existent, and this is because the species are so distant that their mating and reproduction mechanisms are incompatible. Coming up next, we're going to think a bit more about the role of hybridization in evolution, particularly in the context of how new species form or fail to form. I hope to see you there.